Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Lynette Roth and I'm Daimler Curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum and Head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art. And I will be serving as our moderator for Q&A later on. Before we begin today's program, the Harvard Art Museums acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people. And we at the university strive to honor this relationship. I wanna thank you all, and you're still filing in, uh, for joining us this week uh, for our series session, Art Talks Live. Uh, and as many of you know, these talks offer up close look uh, at works from our collections with our Harvard Art Museum's team. And you can join us on Zoom every other Tuesday uh, for these short interactive talks. Today's talk is part of a series inspired by Reframe, a museum-wide initiative to reimagine the function, role, and the future of the University Art Museum. Uh, and in fact, if you haven't seen it already, uh, you can read more about that initiative in uh, this last uh, Sunday edition of the Boston Globe. Uh, these talks in the Reframe series examine difficult histories, foreground untold stories, and experiment with new approaches to the collections of the Harvard Art Museums, reflecting the concerns of our world today. Uh, and our talk today really does um, think about new approaches uh, to the collection. Uh, before we begin, you can see the logistics uh, on your slide, put any questions in the Q&A box, and we will get to them uh, after the talk, which will uh, give us about 10 minutes or so for the Q&A at the end, and we will end promptly at 1 p.m. So now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Jeff Stewart, Director of Div Digital Infrastructure and Emerging Technology at the museums. Jeff directs the museums on the use of a wide range of digital technology. His areas of research include visualization of cultural data sets, open access to metadata and multimedia material, and data interoperability and sustainability. And today he is going to speak to us about games in the prints currently on view in the exhibition States of Play. And just a reminder that the museum is open so please uh, join us. You'll see in the chat uh, a link to reserve a ticket. Please join us at the museums and especially for the exhibition Jeff is going to talk to us about today, a states of play. And uh, with that, I turn it over to you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Lynette. Um, right on. Yeah, so hi everyone. I'm Jeff and thanks for joining me today uh, to, to talk about gaming in the museum for the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, we're going to tinker with the Harvard Art Museums, and we're going to imagine worlds in which the collections in the museum act as game pieces, game boards, and rule sets. Uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be inspired to play the museum by your own rules. Uh, personally, I prefer games that are exploratory and leave uh, much more to the imagination than what is revealed. So if you're familiar with game genres, I'm talking specifically about classic text adventure games, uh, slightly more modern point and click adventure games, and the more contemplative genre of walking simulators. Uh, those are games which have no win-lose con conditions and are, are very much open to interpretation and exploration. Uh, it's this last category that I think mirrors the subjective open-ended nature of art and museums best. So with that in mind, I'm always trying to game the museum and find new ways of expanding access to art. And now I'm gonna share some of the games I found hiding in the Harvard Art Museum's collections. And I'll illustrate this by mapping several different games and genres onto the museum itself, uh, starting with simulators and then, uh, in, and then a few uh, guessing games, think I spy. And ultimately uh, some adventure games, think uh, Zork, uh, Oregon Trail and classic Sierra game, point and click adventures. Uh, and I should also preface that uh, I am referencing a lot of computer games, not necessarily board games or physical games. Um, so we're gonna just jump right in with a game uh, called Conway's Game of Life. And uh, Wikipedia tells us uh, that the Game of Life is a cellular automaton uh, devised by the British mathematician John Horton Conway in 1970. And indeed it is a zero player game meaning that its evolution is determined by its initial state requiring no further input. And uh, we get to create a bunch of rules and observe uh, the evolution of, of 
of those rules on the game board itself. And uh, it's, it looks like this. Uh, it consists of a collection of cells, which based on a few mathematical rules can live, die, or multiply. And depending on the initial conditions, the cells form various patterns throughout the course of the game. Okay, so that's Conway's game of life. Let's actually try to map this game onto the museums and see if we can, we can play, play one of the objects. Uh, and we're going to start with a single print from our current exhibition, States of Play, uh, prints from Rembrandt to Del Sartre. Uh, and this exhibition is about immersing yourself in the world of printmakers, uh, tracing how they create, rework, and refine their images, and at times even play around uh, with their creations until they find an iteration that they are, they are happy with and wish to cast out into the world. Uh, so here we are again in the exhibition, and we're wending our way through it, looking at different artists and artworks and their process, and we find ourselves at the back where we find we encounter Solowitz's complex forms, this cluster of, of prints and states of prints uh, back here. And Solowit is an artist known in part for creating art by writing rule set, rule based systems. That's uh, so in the rules he writes are instructions for creating an artwork. Uh, in the case of complex form, so here's an annotated version noting some of the color mixtures uh, that he, he wanted for, for versions of the print. Uh, and again, here is here is a final version of the print uh, based on that system for mixing and printing colors on top of each other. Uh, so, what what if we took this print and thought of it as a game board and apply our own rules to it? Uh, how might it play out? Uh, and what in particular if we played a variation of Con Conway's game of life on it? And we have our own rules, and we start at the center, activating this uh, this lone polygon, and we say. Uh, and we set our rules in motion and say that every polygon that touches that center one is activated and the polygon that that was activated are now deactivated and we expand outward, uh, you know, frame by frame. We repeat those rules over and over. Uh, let it, let's watch that pattern play out and see how uh, this, this print suddenly becomes a board for um, a version of, of uh, Conway's Game of Life. And there we have a very simple uh, cascading pattern across and a little variation in color palettes. And of course, we can just continue to adjust our rule set a bit with different color palettes and rules for blending. And again, sit back and watch how the game plays out. Uh, creating our own variation, playing with this, this uh, artist prints and reimagining it in a different way. Um, and that is game number one. So the next game, I'm gonna move on to is a guessing game. And I stumbled upon this one while researching artificial intelligence systems. Um, since 2014, we've been asking several different AI systems to augment the descriptions and data produced by curatorial divisions. Uh, here you see a beach scene drawn by the artist Lionel Feininger, uh, the info at the bottom left side. Uh, the slide is the small slice of the descriptive data our curatorial teams produce. Uh, the AI systems we use create data that complements the descriptions from our curatorial staff. Uh, the, the data AIs produce is often mundane, but every once in a while, uh, the AIs truly surprise and delight. And so with this particular image, uh, I was reviewing the data generated by one of our AIs, and I discovered that it wanted to play the game of I Spy. So one of the AIs happened to say to me, I spy with my artificial eye, something that begins with the letter E. Actually, the AI was generous and gave me the whole word instead of, instead of just the first letter. And it said, I spy with my artificial eye, an elephant. Um, do you happen to see the elephant? Uh, how about now? So I stared and stared and finally found it. Um, and here's my uh, rough tracing of what I see as the elephant hiding on the beach in this scene. Now, of course, the artist uh, probably didn't intend to draw an elephant on the beach and was really just drawing uh, a beach scene uh, as they saw it uh, there on that day that they drew it. Uh, but of course, um, what we see in a print is not, does not always align uh, with what the curator sees. And, um, does not always align with what an algorithm sees. And uh, that is part of the beauty of art itself. Recall my comment earlier at the start of this talk about the subjectivity of art. Uh, and, it, and this illustrates uh, a, a wonderfully simple game that you can play throughout the museum. Um, 
interpreting artworks uh, as you see fit. Uh, so let's just play one more time with the AI. And here we have a watercolor with the title Haystacks by the artist Dodge McKnight. And again, the AI said, I spy with my artificial eye an elephant. And this one uh, came to be a little bit quicker this time around. Uh, and here's what I see. Hiding in the back, this haystack uh, was very reminiscent or is very reminiscent of, of the form of an elephant uh, to me. But what was fun is looking at it a little bit further, uh, I came to see a smaller elephant hiding in the foreground. And then after we get through this drawing, a third elephant walking out of the frame on the left. A couple legs there, and uh, there you have it. Uh, three elephants hiding in plain sight, disguised as haystacks. Um, and uh, that is I spy. From there, we're gonna go, from here we're gonna go from guessing games uh, onto simulations. Um, and we're gonna venture away from games based on single objects like those drawings and watercolors and prints and see if we can play a game on a grand cosmological scale. Um, so let's try to play a game with the entire collection of museums, a game in which you can ponder the mysteries of a universe of data and knowledge of the Harvard Art Museums. Um, and we have quite a universe of, of artworks to uh, consider and tinker with. But before playing with all 250,000 artworks, uh, let's start maybe smaller uh, with a subset of artworks. And here in this case, we're gonna start with um, the Wartime Collection, which is on the first floor of our museum in Gallery 1220, uh, come visit. Uh, and if we browse around this room and dive into, and let's browse around this room and dive into one of the paintings uh, and see if it makes a good game piece. So here we have uh, tucked near the corner, a, uh, a little painting, a small painting by Seurat. And uh, we have lots of dis data describing this painting, as I mentioned earlier. We have artist title, medium, chain of ownership, and so much more. Again, most of that info created by our museum staff. Uh, but we also have descriptive data that is produced by algorithms and some fancy math. Uh, again, remember the AI from the previous example. Uh, so we have some computer code that looks at every pixel in a given image and sorts the pixels by similarity, which produces a histogram. Uh, we then distill that data down to say 10 or 12 dominant colors, along with the amount of color found in that image as a percentage of the whole. Of the whole. Uh, so here you're seeing the 10 dominant colors in the image of the Seurat painting. Uh, so let's use this info to turn, turn the painting into a game piece. Um, and here we go, ta-da. Uh, we've taken the color data, we shaped, reshaped it into a series of concentric circles, uh, each one scaled by the percentage of the color it represents in that painting. And so let's look at one more example of this transformation. Uh, here we have another painting tucked away in the opposite corner of the gallery, of the same gallery. Uh, this time it's a Monet painting. And we use that same algorithm of fancy math and we distill it, the image of it down to its dominant colors. And then we reshape that descriptive data, that algorithmically generated descriptive data into a game piece, or as I call them in this situation, uh, suns. So just for a comparison, here's the transformation of both the Seurat and the, and the Monet. Uh, and then we can strip away the images of the paintings and let you ponder those, those artworks as, as data and information. And then we could set them free uh, in a universe. Um, but really we could set them free on a game board. And here we have those game pieces floating away on a game board. And the game board itself has a set of rules, which includes uh, rule number one, uh, the, when the game plays, uh, it automatically se selects a random object from the collection every se second. It draws that object at the center of the game board or universe as a series of concentric circles. And then we give it some some gravity and, and motion and we push it outward in a random direction and we repeat. Uh, but we don't want the simulation of the Harvard Art Museums to be totally passive. Uh, so you as the player get to tinker with the universe in which the artworks exist. Uh, and you could do things like let the suns speak, 
you can fiddle with their magnitude, uh, make the universe more crowded, less crowded. Uh, you can have the sun's cast off matter to form planets and set them off in their own orbits. And you can even tinker at the macro and micro scale and atomize um, the, uh, the artworks into constituent parts. So, okay, let's take one last look at the wartime collection as it exists physically in the galleries of the museums. And now let's transform it and cast the art out into our, into our simulation game. So here's just a short video of the uh, Sons Explorer uh, playing out. This is, this is a recording of me playing, playing the game um, just the other day. And there you have, uh, I'm taking some agency and I'm redefining the universe by scaling those suns, um, bringing some of the descript more descriptive data forward and um, transforming it in, in all sorts of ways. And that is a very brief glimpse at how you can reimagine uh, the museums and collections of the museums uh, on, a, on, a, on a grand cosmological scale. So then you've made it this far, which thank you for sticking with me. Uh, we're gonna venture on to our fourth game, which drifts into those, to that last genre um, of adventure games or text adventure games as I'm most fond of. Um, and we're gonna bring this one back down to earth and re-enter the atmosphere, but land, land far outside the museum walls uh, in a lush green space. Um, and we're landing in the, the art forest. Um, as I mentioned, this particular game is a hybrid text adventure. Uh, it is a text adventure game, a point and click adventure game, and a walking simulator game kind of rolled into one. Um, and it is definitely the most open-ended and exploratory uh, reimagining of the museums um, that uh, we have constructed. And I'm not gonna say much about the rules or construction of the art forest. I'm just gonna show you a snippet of gameplay. Um, and I'm always happy to chat with folks uh, at any point about these particular uh, games and the rule sets that are that are that are that are uh, built for them. So here we have a demo. Uh, this is all browser based, and you can uh, you will be able to play this uh, on your own as well. And it follows very much a classic layout for a text adventure game where you have an input box towards the bottom of the screen um, and a bigger box with the narrative. Um, and you're seeing me play the game and typing in commands uh, to explore the world that's being described to me. And what we find in the art forest is a bench and on that bench are packets of seeds. And we have the opportunity, an option to open those packets to discover um, what type of seeds are inside them and plant them in the forest. And in this case, uh, I had discovered that there is a packet uh, called states of play, oddly enough. And it turns out that in that packet are seeds that are uh, based on those artworks in the exhibition itself. And through a series of actions that I'm discovering as I play the game, I can cast those artworks out into the forest and let the world that this game inhabits uh, take control and see what grows. And this is definitely exploratory and much more um, uh, open-ended in that you can uh, take agency as much as you want or sit back and enjoy um, the forest that you've constructed. And so with that, we're gonna return back to the physical world of the Harvard Art Museums. And we're gonna step back into reality and back into the galleries and venture on to the exhibition States of Play one last time and hopefully see the museum fresh and hopefully see the museum anew. And with that, I'm gonna end it and say thanks for listening and leave you with a few links in case you wanna go play uh, and explore and create.
So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and before we all head to those links and start playing around, um, I, I really wanna try out the art forest <laughs> myself. Uh, we're gonna take a few questions. I actually wanted to start off with one of my own because of course I was um, loving the, the fact that uh, AI thought there might be an elephant on the coast of the Baltic shore uh, as drawn by Lionel Feininger. And I started wondering what is AI's obsession with elephants? Like how many forms are there in its you know, inventory? Like could it have actually seen that that was a beach chair or a set of beach chairs on the, on the beach? Maybe you could uh, explain that a little bit more. Yeah, um, so sure. I, I, you know, I, I definitely handpicked some examples like the elephant in the Lionel Feininger and the AI also um, not only did it say there was an elephant there, but you know the same AI would go on to describe to describe it in a, in a possibly a wild uh, bunch of different scenarios, including you know like it might I, I don't remember at the top of my head if this AI recognized it, but some of them would see you know have do see um, sand or sky or figures in the foreground. So um, I think uh, I always. I could talk about the AI services uh, at, at, at length, but um, I, I do often like to remind folks that the way we're using them are that we're using them as untrained services. And uh, we don't exactly know what, what, um, what the AIs have been fed, you know, the images they've been fed to learn from and the vocabularies they have built up. Uh, so we're letting them I'm letting them use their own vocab vocabularies to describe our artworks um, without imposing any of the descriptions we've already applied to those artworks. So they're looking mm -hmm. at our, their, their, our objects fresh and new based on the experience that was built into them. Um, and it is a bit of a mystery what that experience is uh, because we are just using the services as, any, um, as anyone out in the world could if they're willing to, to pay to use them. Right. Uh, we have a, a great question uh, that came from our audience um, that asks, you may have already mentioned this, but is the ultimate goal to get more people to acclimate themselves with these works of art? Uh, I, for me, the ultimate goal is to, to, to open up access to art, in particular to those who are more science-minded and might not have an affinity to museums or, or, or art collections. Um, and I didn't explain it while going through any of these projects, but they are all built on the museum's data set, which is a representation of you know, our curatorial knowledge and some other um, al algorithmically generated information. And so when I look for these games, they're always rooted in the museums and the collections, and there's always a connective thread. All of these are built on our data set. So uh, you, there is a, 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 a full thread from the very abstract deconstructive use you see on the screen back to the objects themselves, if people mm -hmm. want, want to follow that. Uh, so I'd like, yeah, I'd like people to, to understand that what they're seeing, these abstractive forms are indeed um, another representation of an actual artwork you can go off and see. Um, but bigger goals in particular from, uh, from my department and the work that we do is to um, expand uh, the way uh, people can connect with art and museums themselves. Right, and I think that's what makes this such an important part of you know thinking about the the larger reframe initiative at the museums right so it's you know just as ai comes to it with its own sort of you know uh knowledge or or um set of information right so do we each come to the collections in that way and i think it's it's been very revealing uh we'll talk about color in a second but the work that you've done looking at color uh, across the museum's collections in ways that we could never do without this kind of um, data and, and using the, the um, technologies in the way that, that you do. There, there was a question about um, 
or a comment rather that it was interesting that the colors of the suns for Saran and Monet seem to be darker in hue and don't include the distinctive reds in boats. So the Monet is actually called red boats. Yeah, uh, well, one of the, I guess, downsides of showing the demo on my screen over Zoom is that some of the color bands are probably present um, in a lot of the artworks, you know, but the bands are so, so narrow because if you're looking at the percentage of the whole, um, although that red is dominant, it doesn't necessarily make up that much of the overall uh, composition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the algorithms, of course, could be fine tuned uh, to tease out more of those colors. The other, the other thing I always like to, to note too is that we're we're running our algorithms on uh, images of the artworks themselves which for us have a long history and different way and we've produced them via different ways over uh, many decades you know the images that I'm feeding into the algorithms are uh, the ones that we are taking today and yesterday are with the latest and greatest digital imaging technology and the Im some of the images we're feeding into these systems are digitized, you know, scans of color film from 40, 50 years ago. So yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, there's a fuzziness with the color data itself that it's it's not always easy to explain, but it's but it's uh, something to sort of keep in mind that it's not it's not a hundred percent pure uh, and accurate that it, there's a fuzziness there, uh, which I think also is a good reminder of just the difference in how each individual sees the world. Um, we don't all see the same. We don't see, uh, you know, red necessarily the same way from person to person. Um, so, so yeah, the, the algorithms are interesting it, to see what comes out of it. And it's not always what I expect either. And there was a question about whether these gaming approaches uh, could be used to add layers of analysis to transformations of particular art representations. So the example used in the question is still life from Chardin to Cezanne to Brock, like in the recent MFA exhibition. So beyond you know, the, the way that you've approached um, the collections in these examples, um, could you use that to think about a particular genre, for example? Uh, uh, great question. Uh, my, the quick answer is uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, I definitely would have to think on that a little bit more um, about about what that might look like or or, or 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 what is to be gained. But but certainly, I think there's a lot of there's just a lot of different ways of ex exploring art through the lens of games um, to. Uh, uh, yeah, great example. Mm -hmm. um, I think totally possible to, to explore that, but uh, I'm not sure I have much else to, to add <laughs> well, to I that think for it's now. Sort of thing. It's sort of like if you if if there's something you want to explore, right? Then then you could, based on on the the data that's available. I think that's what's interesting too, is because you're drawing on the information that's available in the database, right? you're going to get also certain results and you're going to be able to do certain things based on what it is we actually track at the museums. I, I'll, I'll add a, a sort of a side comment. It, it, it's sort of related to, the, to, to that, to that um, uh, comment and question. Uh, uh, the Suns Explorer project has been around for many years and, and uh, one iteration of it that I don't know if it still exists live anymore, but actually uh, brought together uh, several different museums, different different museums that had had open data sets, in which we could also, you know, have that color analysis done on it if the data set didn't already include it, um, and start to bring together, um, you know, disconnected physical collections or collections just scattered to the world into one single universe. Um, and I had a few different museums mixed in there, and I didn't, I didn't. Uh, hone in on any particular artist or genre as I was mm -hmm. viewing the multi the, the museums in this single universe, but it was one thing that was really apparent, at least that you could tease out from the Suns Explorer, was how 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 one museum skewed wildly towards like 
the brown tones and like ours skewed towards a more multicolor palette. And, you know, it wouldn't take long to think through like, oh, that museum um, has a heavy collection of, you know, prints and drawings, uh, like Dutch drawings. So that, that makes sense. But it's those things you might not necessarily think about suddenly uh, pop and you're like, oh, I can see now across time and space mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. geography, um, this sort of trend or distribution or pattern. So there's a lot to be explored there. I like to think it's our German expressionist collection that makes us so colorful. <laughs> Right on. Having yeah. just launched our coloring book, um, there is a great question I want to be sure we address, and that's um, how the digital humanities initiatives at Harvard may have been using uh, the museum's digital asset in their research. Uh, yeah, one of our long our longstanding partners on campus is the Harvard Meta Lab Group. Um, they've been around for for many years now, and and they've they've. Uh, pushed hard on our data and have been have been doing their own exploration, including building um, experimental, uh, you know, visualization and, and curation uh, interfaces for 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 curating the collection in different ways. Um, so they definitely that group in particular has been um, a good partner in in exploring on their own and then uh, connecting back to to that helped feed into uh, us developing some of the algorithms we have in place further and finding different pockets of data to augment to support the type of work that they're doing. Um, but yes, the, uh, the digital humanities on campus, uh, at least through the Harvard Meta Lab has, has, has um, done quite a lot of experimental visualization. Um, and I will put in a plug for some projects that are coming up in the spring at the museums that they will be showcasing uh, in our Lightbox gallery um, that are uh, an extension of a lot of the ideas expressed here and uh, pushing our data even, even, even harder in, in different ways. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Great, so another reason to come and visit us. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the Lightbox gallery is on our fifth floor of the museums. I want to end actually with a comment uh, from one of our participants uh, who writes, um, interesting, a kind of deep art. At the museum space level, it sort of explores the museum as art. It's, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I hope if anything, this uh, encourages people to think about, you know, being able to play the museum based on their own rules, thinking about museums and art uh, to be remixed and reimagined. Um, and as, you know, museum as, as and collection as, as its own entity that, that uh, can, be, can be used in, 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 uh, by you in, in ways that we can't even imagine from within the museums itself. So uh, yes, thank you for that comment. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and uh, we're always excited to hear uh, what you're working on and uh, really appreciate your taking the time to uh, invite us in to all of these games we can now um, take our own uh, turn at uh, using the Harvard Art Museum's collections. Uh, I want to uh, let everyone know, please join us in two weeks time uh, for our next art talk. That's Tuesday, November 2nd. We're going to hear about a group of watercolors by Zelda Fitzgerald with our curator of drawings, Joachim Holman. And of course, you can always visit our online calendar for more information about all of our online programs, which are always free. Uh, and please do come by the museum in person with an online reservation. And we are also now free on Sundays. So keep that in mind as well. And thank you again, Jeff. And thank you all for um, joining us today.